Hi, I'm Judy Gaudier, and I'm a designer for Studio E Fabrics. And I have designed this fabulous quilt right here using Pepper Corey's Peppered Cottons. Peppered Cottons are beautiful shot cottons made by Studio E, and they're so gorgeous, I just had to make a quilt with them. So this is what I've come up with, and it's called Roaring Twenties. In Roaring Twenties, we use lots of different techniques. We use techniques where you can sew by hand, and we use techniques that you can sew on machine. We wanted to have something that was portable, that you could take with you when you're sitting and waiting, instead of just deleting emails while you're waiting in the doctor's office or you know sitting at a soccer game, what have you. So these blocks lend themselves to being portable in addition to sewing them on the sewing machine. So you'll have lots of different techniques in every single block. This block right here is the block that we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about the sewing techniques involved. You can see that it has multiple techniques. It's a 12 and a half inch block and it finishes at 12. And there are applique and paper piecing uh, techniques involved in making this block. So watch this video and you'll see how to accomplish this wonderful, wonderful block. And we're going to be putting the whole thing together to make this fabulous quilt. What you will need for your block in terms of fabric, you will need the pepper cottons, charcoal, ginkgo gold, atomic tangerine, aubergine, carnation pink, and tomato red. Those are the colors that you're going to be using for this block. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about paper piecing. There are a lot of great videos on the web about paper piecing. So you can choose this one or you can choose any other one that makes the most sense to you. But we're gonna to touch on how to paper piece because it's very important for several of these blocks. So paper piecing comes on patterns and we've already discussed how you're gonna tape these pieces together to make your pattern the right size. Pay very close attention to the one inch square that is provided on the pattern and that you measure that ahead of time to make sure you truly are, this square really does measure one inch by one inch. That's very important. So I've already taped my pattern together and on paper piecing patterns, there will be letters and numbers. This has letters A, B, and C. And basically what that tells you is which, which piece of fabric are you going to use? A is going to be tomato red, B and C are aubergine. So B and C are aubergine, the purple. So I've written that on my pattern. That is a great help. And I'm going to, I wrote tomato red on piece A. So it's a very good piece of information to give someone is to tell them to use the PDF and look up the colors that these pieces are all supposed to be and then write them on your pattern. That's important. When you actually sew for paper piecing, you're sewing on the paper but your fabric is actually on the opposite side of the paper. So it's a little bit backwards and you just gotta train yourself a little bit on how to think. It's just, just a little bit different of a thought process. So now piece A is tomato red. I need a piece of tomato red fabric that is going to be the size of these dotted lines and the inside of this. But actually I need it to be slightly larger than this because remember we have to have seam allowance. Every time you cut something, whether you're sewing garments or whether you're sewing uh, quilts, you have to have seam allowance. So the piece that I'm going to cut has to be the size of piece A or slightly larger. So here's the piece that I've cut. One suggestion I'm going to give you too is that you can print out two of these. Well, you're going to need to print out a total of six because you have six blocks of this particular block in the quilt. But you might want to print out an additional one and just cut out these pieces and use them to approximate the size of your um, fabric. So you could cut a piece of, uh, cut this piece out as A and then use it to just roughly cut something slightly larger than piece A. Or you can just do what I've done and lay it down on your fabric and cut around it so that it's bigger than the actual piece. You see my fabric extends beyond where piece A is. My fabric extends beyond that. So you have to have it extend beyond that around the whole perimeter of that piece. You have to have it bigger here and here as well. That's very important. You can also score your pattern with a some type of scoring utensil, something that's used by scrapbookers. 
You can also use your wooden skewer to score it so that you can fold this piece easily on those dotted lines and, and then cut your piece to fit. Okay, now the next step is to cut out my piece for the aubergine. Um, this says piece number two. Okay, so we need to cut out this piece. Now you can either go ahead and cut a piece that is shaped exactly like this, only larger, considerably larger, maybe a half an inch larger all around, or you can just take a large rectangular piece, which is what I usually do. Now, some people say that paper piecing is wasteful. Well, yes and no. There are advantages to paper piecing. Even though there's a little more waste, you do get certain effects that you would not get using templates. However, templates might be more thrifty, but you may not get all the effects that you want to get and get them as perfectly as when you paper piece. So keep that in mind. There are going to be advantages and disadvantages to both for sure. So one of the ways that you can tell if you have enough fabric and if it's going to land correctly when you're, when you're sewing it is to take this piece. Remember, we said we scored this so that it would fold better. Fold it on that dotted line. And then you take your your aubergine, your next piece that you're sewing, and you um, put it right sides together with your tomato red. And I'm going to put my tomato red, I'm just gonna actually pin that tomato red piece onto here. Some people use two-sided double stick tape initially to keep their um, pieces intact on their pattern. I'm just gonna pin this just loosely for now, okay. And I am going to fold this back. Now, if when I fold this back, since this is my stitching line here, if when I'm folding this back, and if this piece has coverage all the way around it, if it's covered by the aubergine all the way around, then I know that when I flip this out and I go to sew on this line, and then I flip that piece out, it's going to be big enough. So that will become apparent when I sew this together. All right, so I flipped it like this onto itself. And this piece indeed does, is long enough. It is big enough to cover this whole piece so that when I do go back and flip it out like this, and then this fabric gets flipped out, it will fit. So now when I go to my sewing machine, I'm going to stitch on this line. I'm going to put some pins in there so that my aubergine piece doesn't shift. And I'm going to stitch on that dotted line. All right, these are right sides together, the pieces of fabric. And also you're going to make your stitch length tiny. So I'm on a Bernina and Bernina is normally 2.7 or something like that for a regular stitch length. I'm actually going to bring that way down to closer to one. And the reason for that is because when you punctuate the paper and you perforate the paper with your needle, you want it to be perforated in short distances so that when you go to tear this off, you are having an easier time of it. There are more punctures in it and that makes it easier to tear that apart. Okay, so now I've stitched this. These two are right sides together and I've stitched down my dotted line all the way down and now I'm going to flip this out, this purple one, the aubergine. I'm going to flip it out and I'm going to go over and I'm going to press this. You don't want, you want to make sure that you don't have any lips like this so that when you join the next piece, you've got a lip there. Okay, make sure that when you press it, you've pressed it outward, press it outward. Okay, now I've done piece one and I've sewn it to piece number two. Now I'm going to go to piece number three. So I have to stitch on the line between piece one and piece three. So again, we're going to flip this back like this onto itself so that when I put my rectangle here, right sides together with my tomato red, I'm going to know whether or not I have complete coverage of that piece. Well, that's getting kind of close to the edge. So I'm going to move this over and move this over a little bit so that I do have complete coverage of this piece. And down here, do I have complete coverage of this piece? I do. Okay, so I know that I have enough fabric to cover that. So I'm gonna flip this out and I'm going to put pins on my dotted lines once again. Or however, with a lot of paper piecing patterns, 
may not have dotted lines. Their, their lines may be different. It's not necessarily the dotted line. It might just be the solid line between piece one and piece two or piece one and piece three. Okay, so you always do a numerical, in numerical order. You're always going to do it in numerical order. You're going to do between piece one and piece two. You're going to find that line, and that's first. And then sometimes it might be between two and three, like depending on your pattern. This is obviously for making this particular block. It just depends on the block. So you're going to always do numerical order. Okay, so that's what it looks like on the opposite side. I'm going to go to the sewing machine, and I'm going to stitch with a small stitch length all the way down this to the very, very bottom point right there. I'm going to stitch all the way along there and stop. Okay, so now I've stitched down there, and this is what it looks like on the opposite side, so I'm going to flip it. And this is actually, you know, the right side. This is the right side of the piece. And then I'm going to press this out. And then we're going to talk about seam allowance and trimming them down. Okay, so now I've got these. They look like this on the right side, right? Okay, so this is my center piece. Here's the finished block. Here's what it's going to look like, right? Okay, so you can see where we are with this. Looks a lot bigger here because we haven't done any trimming yet. So we need to trim those seam allowances a little bit. Now you could, if you're brave, you can just take a scissors. This is what I would do because I've been sewing for a bazillion years and just trim it with your scissors. I'm gonna start on this end and I'm gonna trim it with my scissors and just trim down there. Careful not to catch any other things in there. Okay, just trimming my seam allowance down to about a quarter of an inch because quarter inch seam allowances are what we like. We're not going to trim it closer than that. We don't want to have an open seam, okay? Okay, so we're trimming. The other thing you can do beside is what a lot of people do is they take um, a ruler and a rotary cutter and they do an actual quarter inch. Now make sure you're, I've got my paper folded back there too. So the only thing exposed here is my seam allowance. See that? Okay, so you're going to lay that on your seam and measure an actual quarter inch and then go ahead and trim with your rotary cutter. It works too, either way. Both ways work nicely. And at that point, you probably want to take these pins out of here because I can feel those underneath and then it's not flat. Okay, now this is much bigger. This is extending over the edges here. You can see that I haven't trimmed that entire piece down yet. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do my next units before I trim everything up. I'm going to go ahead and sew the charcoal and pink units. Okay, so then it works the same. You get the same end result. You've got your seam allowances trimmed. So I'm going to put this aside and I'm going to do my next piece. Okay, same procedure here. Here's my one, two, and three, my numerical order of my pieces. One, two, and three. I've labeled them as to what color is going to be on those. This is tomato red, this is charcoal, and this is carnation pink. So this time though, we're sewing between lines one and line two, or section one and two on the line here, which is what we did before. But now we're going to sew on the line between section two and section three, instead of going from one to three. So we're going to do the line between section one and two, and then the line between section two and three, numerical order once again. So I've pre-cut, I've gone ahead and pre-cut this in the shape that it needs to be. I'm laying this down on here. Okay. Now I need to know that my charcoal piece is going to be big enough to cover this. So I'm going to turn it like this and you can hold it up to a light box or a sunny window at this point to make sure that it's going to fit because this piece doesn't extend, it's not the end, this piece is still hanging on there. So I know that, I, I wanna know that this piece, is, this piece here, that my charcoal colored piece is going to fit on there. So I'm going to flip it over and at this point I may go to a sunny window or to a light box and hold it over that to make sure it is. But I've got this piece cut large enough so that I know it's going to fit. Okay, but always you know, know that you can use 
a sunny window or a light box to see if you're, and hold this over it, hold it up to the window like this, you know, hold it, and then you can see if your piece is going to provide enough coverage. If you're, if you're trying to scrimp and you don't have a big enough piece and you want to know for sure that your piece is going to cover it. I don't have to scrimp because I've got enough fabric here, but that may actually happen to you. All right, so then I'm going to put my pins in here again, and I'm gonna stitch on this dotted line. These two are right sides together, although peppered cottons do not have a right and a wrong side, but you may be doing something paper piecing with two prints, and so these pieces would be right sides together because in the end, you're gonna be folding them out like this. That's why it has to be right sides together. And I'm going to go with my tiny little sewing machine stitch again and stitch between on the line between one and two. Okay, so this is what I did. I stitched along here. And remember, these were right sides together. So when I flip this out, it's going to be like this. All right, and then the next piece I'm going to do is going to go up right sides together here, and then it's going to flip up to cover this piece. So you're going to have your pink piece right sides together with these two, and then you flip it up and it covers this piece here. So I'm going to trim my seam allowance like I showed you in the prior frames and then iron it. Okay, now I'm gonna show you what it's like to work with a actually skinnier piece when you, when you maybe have less fabric available. I've chosen to do this with a skinnier piece so I can show you what I was talking about before. I am going to score this piece right here. I'm gonna score along that line between two and three so that it folds easy. And I'm gonna fold this over because this is how that fabric is going to be laying when I, when I sew them right sides together. So I wanna know that, that my fabric is gonna actually cover this whole piece. So there's a skinnier piece, right? So I need to know that this piece here is going to be covered, is gonna be enough to cover this piece here. Now you might have it very close to the border, which I do right here, it's kind of close to the edge. And this is gonna to happen to you when you're trying to conserve fabric. So it's kind of close to the edge here, but it covers. And it's close to the edge here, but it covers. And it's up here and it covers. So it's going to work. It's going to be big enough. So I am going to pin this carefully. And I'm also going to pin it. Now take note of this, I'm pinning this carefully, this line between one or between two and three. Also remember what I said, it might not, when you're paper piecing, it might not always be a dotted line. There might be a solid line. It just depends on the pattern and who creates the pattern. It's always gonna be the line in numerical order. So now take note of this. I am going to actually put some pins down here. Even though I'm not sewing down here, I'm sewing on this line up here, I'm actually going to put some pins down here because I don't want that pink piece to move. I don't want it to shift. I want it to stay right where it is because I'm working with a skinnier piece and I don't want it to shift. So I've got my, my pins down here and I've got pins up here and I don't want it to shift. I'm going to take it to the sewing machine and I'm going to stitch on that line. Okay, so now moment of truth, I'm gonna unpin that And we have quite the large seam allowance chunk here. So I'm going to take my ruler and trim. I'm gonna flip this up and does it cover? Indeed it does, it does, yay. So now you're gonna either use a little pressing wooden stick, one of those little wooden pressing sticks and press here or take it over to the iron. Okay, so now I'm gonna trim this piece up. I'm going to put my edge of my ruler on my, my um, cutting line. The edge of my ruler I'm going to put on my cutting line and I'm gonna trim this up. Now, yeah, you're going over some paper with your nice rotary cutter blade. So that may require you to replace that blade. At least it can be replaced. It's not like a scissors, a sewing scissors that when it gets dull, you have to wait to find somebody to sharpen it, which I have plenty of those scissors in this house that somebody used for other things. All right. So you can save these scraps here. Do not throw them away. They're gonna be good for other things. You know, other paper piecing projects, other projects, they're gonna be good for those. So just hang on to your scraps. And I have a whole book written about what to do with scraps. 
Okay. There we go. And now make sure these don't slip. These tiny little pieces like this, it's imperative that you make sure that you that they're not shifting and that they're not slipping because there's not a lot there. There we go. Okay, so now once that's trimmed and I trim up this one, I can sew them together. Okay, so now these are all trimmed up and I need to sew them together. So I go over to my back side. I go flip them over so you can see the wrong side and how they're supposed to be sewn together. Now the other piece of this is, the other side of this is just mirror image of this. It's identical to this one. You stitch it together exactly the same way that you stitch this one together. And then you go to stitch this one to this one, all right? And then the other side to this side. So. We're going to, these are the lines we're going to join them on, are these dotted lines right here. You join them on those dotted lines. But how do you know that you're going to get those points in the exact right place that you're supposed to get them? Well, now notice I've got this pink piece pinned here because it's, this could flip around quite a bit. It's, it's a little loosey-goosey thing. So you can either use double stick tape. At this point, I would say avoid the double stick tape because when you go to dislodge it, it's going to stretch this to kingdom come, okay? So just pin that for now and then we're going to put a pin through this match point this is going to be the point that matches with this point so we're going to put a pin through here right at the peak and then we're going to make sure that it goes directly through this spot here and don't drink three cups of coffee before you do this because you'll be all shaky There, just like that. Bring the pin all the way up so that the head is there so that it's not going to move, okay? All right, so you want that to stay together there. Then you're going to put in pins down the dotted line. You're going to pin through that dotted line and you're going to make sure you look on the other side that it's coming through where, yep, look at how perfect that is. That's what you want it to be like, all the way down. You're going to pin it like that, all the way down. And you're going to make sure. Yep, that, that pin is right there where it came through, right where I put it in. So you know that these are in the exact right place. You do this all the way down. Then you go to the sewing machine and you stitch. Now it came through right there, came through a little to the side there, which is a little to the side there, so you know it's going to work. If you have to have it go through exact, you can. Through the line exactly. There. Exact. It's pretty exact there. Okay. All the way down. And then you're going to check to see if this match point here is going to match with this match point there. So let's see. Let's poke a punch a pin through there and see if they match up. And they do, perfectly, okay? Now, go to your, leave it like that, just like you did with the other one, leave it there, and go to the sewing machine and stitch down with a small stitch length again, stitch down this line. Okay, so now I have my last piece on here that I'm going to join, all right? This is the last piece that I'm gonna join with the paper piecing section of this block. Um, and there's a lot to unpack here when you get down to this bottom piece. You have to push this over, the piece that we did first, the two pieces that we did first. You have to push that seam allowance over because you're going to have another seam allowance that's going to come right together down here. Do your same system where I showed you to put the pin in and find those points, those match points here. See that? Those match points, that's important. Put that in there and then pin down it and then push that one to the side, and you're going to end right there at that point so that you'll get a perfect point. Okay, so this is darn near perfect, the points, and we're going to be then doing the applique section of this block. You could, if you want to, trim it up 
to 12 and a half inches, but I do believe that if you're paper piecing, you're, it's going to be exactly 12 and a half inches. But go ahead and trim this block down to 12 and a half inches. You're not going to want to cut off any points at the bottom. And one very, very important thing, once you have your paper off of here, because you're gonna start doing your applique section, don't manhandle these edges here. These edges are bias edges, so be very, very careful. You're going to be doing six of these blocks. You don't want these edges to be wavy at all. So be very careful when you're pressing. Don't use your iron like a rolling pin. Press up and down. So let's talk about the applique section of this block. Okay, so now we've come to the applique section of this block. There is a diamond that get, gets appliqued to the center, if you look at the picture of the block, and then there's a circle that gets appliqued to the top of that. So you look at these patterns. Again, these was, we came with the download. You've got to make sure that this one inch square is one inch for scale. And then you're going to decide whether or not you are going to do this like a raw edge applique or using a satin stitch on your sewing machine? Um, or are you going to do some type of a needle turn technique where there is um, a, a seam allowance? Now this is the dashed line that shows where the seam allowance would start. It would start between here and here, and that's what you would fold over for your seam allowance. If you did needle turn applique where you do that tiny little turn, then you would cut it like right outside the dashed line. The dashed line is actually the size of the circle. The circle is actually this size, all right? And then anything outside of that dashed line is the part that gets turned under. That's why if you're going to do a, like a raw edge applique or machine applique using a satin stitch or a zigzag or whatever, this is the size that your circle is going to be. So you're actually going to cut it on that dashed line. And it says that right here. For raw edge or fusible applique, use the dotted line templates. All right, so then you don't need that additional seam allowance. For needle turn or machine applique, cut the templates with the seam allowance. Okay. The type of applique that I do is different than what a lot of people might do. Um, I tend to use a blind hem stitch from my on my sewing machine and I do my applique that way. There's lots of different ways that you can applique that on. Um, you can do it by hand with a needle turn approach and I'm going to demonstrate. There's probably, you know, dozens of different ways that people applique, but I'm going to choose a couple of different applique techniques and talk about those. And then those will um, apply to this diamond as well. So I won't have to repeat the methods for applique on the diamond because they'll be the same. I'll, but I'll demonstrate them for the circle. Okay, I'm gonna show you my favorite method of applique. There are, like I said, there are a lot of different ways to do it, but this happens to be my favorite. So I am going to cut out the um, circle on the dashed line using my, I'm gonna go right outside that dashed line, just a little bit outside that dashed line, using my scissors that are my junk scissors that were once good enough to cut fabric with, but then somebody in the fam many people in the family probably grabbed it when they couldn't find another scissors to open the dog food bag or all kinds of things that they did with it. So it's no longer a good scissors. And I'm gonna go around this circle. Now, I'm going to add my own seam allowance when I do this, as many people who are applicators are already going to say that they, they do the same thing. They determine how much seam allowance they want. So since this is the actual size of the circle, the actual finished size of the circle, this is what I'm going to work with. So I've taken a piece of the peppered cotton that is required for this block, which is the Atomic Tangerine, and I want to show you why it's orange and it's a shot cotton. It has yellow threads that go one direction, isn't that gorgeous? Yellow threads and pink threads along the other, you know, one along the warp and one along the weft. And when those are woven together, it makes the fabric look orange. Isn't that just beautiful? Okay, so 
what I'm going to do now, I've starched this piece multiple times. And the reason I've starched it is because now I'm going to draw around this with a pencil and I don't want the fabric to shift. See, look at how it's shifting even now, even though I've starched it, you're going to get a little shifting and then that would distort your circle a little bit. Okay, so I've st starched it so that I can draw a circle on here. Now that circle that I'm drawing is the circle I'm going to stitch right on. I'm going to sew right on that. Actually, I'm probably going to stitch right outside of that, just on the outside edge of that circle. I'm going to stitch right on the outside edge of that circle. And I have another piece, and you don't have to worry about right sides together with this. Normally, if you were doing something that had a print, yes, you'd have to worry about right sides together, but this is a shot cotton and there's no right and wrong side. All right, so I've got another piece under it that I didn't starch because I want it to be a little bit lighter in, when you're handling it. Um, you could also use, for the opposite side of this, you could use a very lightweight interfacing. Um, fusible interfacing works nicely. If you were going to do that, you would put the glue side up as being the right side. And I'll show you that maybe later when we're, I'll show you that technique too, because that's a good one. So, okay, so I've drawn my circle on here and I'm going to go over to the sewing machine and I'm going to sew just outside of that circle. Okay, now I'm about to stitch right around the outside of this circle. Now, when you're stitching, when you're sewing this together, there are going to be two of them together and you're going to stitch around them and then you're going to make a cut and you're going to flip them right sides out and that's how you're going to get your circle. When you do this, when you're sewing a circle, you're going to sew, if I'm sewing along here, I'm sewing along the straight of grain. You see that? That's the straight of grain of the fabric. If I'm sewing around this side of the circle, I'm sewing around the bias, right? There's, there's the bias edge there. And then there's the straight of grain. So here's the here's the bias edge as as I sew. There would be the bias edge, and up along here is more of the straight of grain. So that's going to make a difference when you flip it right sides out as to how nice your curve is going to flip out. Have you ever sewn a Peter Pan collar on a shirt for a little child or something like that, and you can't understand why that beautiful curve isn't coming out just perfectly? You've clipped, you've trimmed. And it's still, it, well, it's because of the fabric. It's not because of you or you've not done anything wrong. It's because your fabric on that section wasn't on the curve. It's like if you tried to do a bias binding with a quilt. Um, well, no, if you tried to use a straight binding around a curved edge, that wouldn't work, would it? If you had a curved edge on your quilt and you, you put a, a straight grain binding on it, you'd have a mess. It wouldn't go around the curve nicely. So what I'm going to do to remedy this is I am going to rotate one of them. So at least one of them is on the bias. When this is on the, so when I'm sewing on the straight of grain here, here it's going to be on the bias. Whoops, here it's going to be on the bias. If I'm sewing on the straight of grain here, on this side, it'll be on the bias. If I'm sewing on the straight of grain here, on this side, it's going to be on the bias. So you'll see that when I, when I put it together. Okay, so now I'm going to stitch. I'm going to stitch right outside, right outside of that pencil line that I drew. I'm going to do it slowly because I want not to have it end up being an oval. You can use your presser foot and watch where that presser foot falls along that circle. This is hard to do unless you have your sewing machine programmed to make an exact circle if it's computerized, but if you're a human being and you're using your human eye, it takes a lot of time and experience to stitch something like this in a perfect circle. It really, really does, so take your time. that one of the spots that I sewed is not exactly perfect, but it's, it's pretty close. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna do is trim that circle. Okay, so I'm going to trim my circle, but I don't wanna get too close to the, I wanna get close, but I don't wanna get so close to those threads that I end up with, you know, 
my seam allowance coming through to the other side to the opening. You don't want to make an opening by mistake. So you want to stitch close. If you're, you know, actually you could probably stitch over that a second time to prevent that from happening if you wanted to. Or make your stitch length smaller. That will hold that a little bit tighter and keep it from having those seam allowances pop through. Now when you go to turn this right sides out, it would be really, really helpful to have a turning bodkin. A turning bodkin is a metal, little metal, uh, looks like a crochet hook almost, and you could use a crochet hook. And it has a, a ball on the end of it. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm actually going to do that. I am going to stitch around that another time because I can see some spots that are kind of close to that seam allowance and I am worried that it will pop out. So you can either stitch it twice to reinforce that or make your stitch length smaller like we did with the paper piecing. You can make your stitch length smaller. But make, make sure you don't alter the shape of your circle when you're doing this. Right on that same stitching line. Okay. Now I'm going to make a little slit turn this right sides out. You could slit it in two directions because this is going to be against the fabric. So this is, in, this doesn't, it's, yeah, that's a good way to do it so that you're not trying to push the whole thing through a very small opening. This is where the turning bodkin comes in because you're going to turn this right sides out. I'm just using my thumb. I don't have long nails because I'm a nurse. So I have short nails. So I'm not going to poke anything through. And you do get those little, like I said, from not having it be on a bias edge 100%, you get those little spots that look flattened or not perfectly rounded. You can pick those out with a needle too. Now, you can choose to applique this down using a needle turn technique with like just a needle and thread and using an applique, or you can do it using the blind hem on your sewing machine. And I'm gonna show you the blind hem technique because that's my favorite way to do it. You're going to find the spots that need to be worked and gently work those so that they're more rounded. Okay, now I've set my little peach circle aside and I have brought out my gold, ginkgo gold. I did the exact same technique where I traced it around the um, spot where it was the dashed line rather than the cutting line. And this one's going to be a little bit simpler because you're not going to have the um, worry so much about getting it perfectly round because we've got sides that aren't meant to be rounded. So again, we're going to stitch right outside that pencil line. I'm going to bring my stitch length down. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about with that. Anna Vernina, you are bringing your stitch length down so that your sewing, your stitches are smaller. Especially when I get to the corners here, because when I turn these right sides out, I don't want to have a hole. I want to have a really nice, sharp point. Underneath my sliding table, 
my sewing machine. I have just a, an assortment of things. So I'm glad that the camera does not, can get in close enough to my foot that not everyone can see the mess underneath my sewing machine. I would like to know how many people out there have, oh, a few stray buttons if you're a garment sewist underneath your slide table and lots of pins and maybe a measuring tape under there and a pencil or two and then some extra sewing machine needles. I would wonder how many people have the exact same situation as I do. And done. Okay. So now I'm going to cut close to that stitching. But I'm going to leave myself enough of a seam allowance that it doesn't pop out. Now, if you're concerned for your long armor, that, or if you long arm this yourself, I'm going to go this way, that this is because it's doubled and it's it's going to be kind of thick to once you do the quilting over it you can cut away more of that backing um you just need that basically you're making a facing is what you're doing when you, while the whole purpose of doing this technique is that you're making i'm going to cut these i'm going to clip these right here i'm trying to get closer with some light the light is working against me okay so i'm going to clip these right there all right so I don't have a lump in there anyways what I was saying is basically what we're doing by doubling these is making a facing you're making a facing and that provides an a place to do your 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 quilting or your applique whether it's by machine or whether it's by hand all right now we're going to make that same opening in the back of our a better angle here okay we're gonna make that same opening And this is what I'm talking about, about cutting some of this away. You could later cut some of that away. I'm not going to do it now because I want to flip this right sides out. And then after I flipped it right sides out and pressed it, then I can go back and cut some of that away. So see, I'm making a facing, basically. And again, a turning bodkin, something gentle to flip those points out. Not something so pointy that you're going to poke through it, make a hole, and just work it. Gently. Even a dull pencil can work. Don't use a sharp knitting needle. If you have a bamboo knitting needle that has a somewhat dull end to it, a soft end, like this one right here. Even that, though, you got to be careful. Just work it gently. Work those points out gently. So now you have this nice facing. And don't want to poke through that. You have this nice facing, and you can use that to help you applique. You can actually make your stitches into the facing so that you can't see them from the top. And I'll show you that technique in addition to showing you the technique of how to do it by machine. And you could just straight stitch over the top of it by machine and no one would ever know that that wasn't part of the quilting. So if you had this on top of your block and you just straight stitched over the top of it and then echoed maybe inside of it, once you have taken it to the quilter, it would absolutely look like part of the quilting and then you wouldn't have had to worry about your applique stitches at all. That is all Ind individual preference. 
But because one of the emphasis of this quilt was to be, see how nice these points are coming out, was to be that you would be able to take it on your lap, like if you are at a soccer game or if you are, you know, with a group of friends and you're sitting outside, you'd have this on your lap, um, working at it. That's part of the reason we, we put applique into these blocks as well. Okay, so I'm gonna go and press this. Okay, now if you look at the picture of the block, so here's our block that we paper pieced, and here's our pieces that we're going to applique. If you look at the picture of the block, this is placed right in the center, dead center, and then that little peach circle is right above it, okay? Now, if you have little applique pan, pins, you might wanna pin this down with little applique pins. Let's talk about what I was saying about it being too thick, possibly. If, depending on what fabric you're using, the peppered cottons, these just, they don't get too thick. They're, they're just a wonderful weight. But if you were concerned about this being too thick when you send it to the quilter, I would just snip that backing piece away, okay? Just snip those pieces away in the back, and that will keep it from getting so thick. Now, what I was talking about also when I was sewing, see, this is, this is a facing. That's what you have now, is you have a facing. The other thing I was talking about before, when I was at the sewing machine, is that you could actually use the same color, use gold thread, and you could applique your trying, or diamond using just a straight, straight stitch, top stitching right along the edge here. That's one technique. Just stitch it right with a nice straight stitch about an eighth of an inch away from the edge, okay, all the way down. So that's one method you could use to applique this. Then when you take it to the quilter, she or he could, or if you're going to quilt it yourself, do echoes inside that straight stitch, and then it would look just like it was part of the quilting. That would be one way of appliquing it. Another way of appliquing it would be to do the traditional applique where you're using it, doing it on your lap at home using a needle and a thread. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do. And then I will show you another way to applique using the top little circle up there. Okay, so now I'm going to pin this down and I have a sh one short pin. I don't have a lot of short pins because I don't do, here's another one, I don't do a ton of applique. I know how to do it, I can do it well, but I don't do it a lot unless it's by machine. It's probably because I'm working as a nurse, a shop owner, fabric designer, a pattern designer, I've written five books for CNT Publishing, and I have a family. So you can imagine that I'm probably not going to get very much sewing done if I'm doing it by hand, right? And I'm doing all of these jobs all the time. <laughs> okay, now I have a really good friend who, okay, here's my, my threaded needle. Here's my threaded needle, a tiny, a smaller needle. Um, and I have a really good friend who knows this saying in German, and she says it beautifully in German, but it translates to English as long thread, lazy girl. So if you have a long thread, it means you're too lazy to keep re-threading your, your, your needle. And I tend to err on the side of doing that from time to time. So I'm here to tell you, don't work with a really long thread because what's gonna happen is it's gonna take you a lot longer in the long run um, to, to do something because you're gonna end up untangling your knots. Now I'm not real picky about threads. This is sulky, this particular thread. I use superior thread a lot for piecing on the sewing machine. Okay, so you could put a lightweight stabilizer underneath this. You prob Yes, that would be a good idea to do that. I'm not going to add another stabilizer because I am concerned that this is going to get too thick. So I'm gonna start appliquing by coming up through the other side and I'm going to go into my facing. I'm gonna stitch into my facing. I'm not gonna stitch 
into the top of this at all. I'm, I'm coming up through my facing. I'm going to go down into exactly where I came up from. Now you can see how you could do this on your lap. In fact, I was appliquing one time in my lap at the hospital, not where I was when I, when I was working. I was there to get my mammogram and I had my gown on. And I brought my applique work while I was sitting and waiting to be the next patient. And I stitched my applique right to my hospital gown. Okay, one of the dangers of lap quilting. All right, so then I'm coming up again through my facing and then you go down exactly where you came up. You go down into the spot where you can, not the same hole, but where in the spot where you came up. Look at that. It's totally, totally invisible. A lot of people use those nice little magnified specs so they can see what they're doing. It always helps to see what you're doing. All right, now if you find it too cumbersome to keep going up and down, it's kind of relaxing. It's so, it's actually very relaxing. This is not, you're not doing this for speed. Now see that, you're going, you're coming up through that facing. You're coming up through the facing. Not through the top. You can always go down under that like you would with the binding and come up, come up through your facing. You don't have to do that whole entire motion of up and down each time. I just unknotted my, my thread. Now I'll come up through there. Now I'm going to go down and come up again through my facing. Okay. Come up through my facing, not through, not through the front of it. And then you're going to have a totally invisible, completely and totally invisible applique. And it, when applique is done by hand and it's done invisibly like this, there's nothing better. There's no machine applique that can even compare to the look of doing it like this by hand. Now, there are better and greater applique quilters out there than me, definitely. And if you wanted to comment on this video on YouTube, that would be wonderful because we can all learn from each other. You can talk about what kinds of thread you use, what you think is the best thread. You can talk about all kinds of things. That's the beauty of YouTube. You can stop periodically and readjust your grip. Come up through that facing. If you come up through the seam itself, it's gonna be a little bit hard to push your thread through there. Come up through that facing. And continue to do this all the way around. totally invisible. Okay, I finished the gold diamond. I've appliqued that on and I'm going to show you that in a minute, how wonderful and how beautiful that looks. There's just no stitches visible from the top side. And now we're going to applique the peach colored circle, the atomic tangerine, using the blind hem stitch. Now, the blind hem stitch will be different on everyone's machine. So the big point that I want to make with this is that you're going to have to test your stitch before you start stitching on your piece on a scrap of fabric, okay? So I've engaged my blind hem stitch on my Bernina, and I've made the um, this part right here smaller than what it initially starts out at. So you don't want that zigzag piece to be huge. You want it to be small. You want it to be small. You want to just grab a, a little section of the fabric. You don't want it to be real obvious. 
and you don't want your stitch length to be real long either. So I have adjusted the stitch length. And then you're going to use your zigzag foot. So you put your zigzag foot on your sewing machine. <clears throat> and then, like I said, you're gonna take a scrap. You're gonna take a scrap of fabric and you're going to experiment and adjust your length and your width of your stitch to, to get to the point where it looks like it looks good. Okay, now I've adjusted mine to look like this so that, I don't know how easy that is to see because the thread is kind of camouflaged, but I've got smaller, smaller little zigzags out and then shorter stitches in between each zigzag. Um, so I, I, I could probably increase that zigzag a little bit so that it catches more of the fabric it goes in more so that you're catching more. The idea being if you want to kind of stitch in the ditch basically um, yeah I think that this looks a little bit better. You want to stitch in the ditch and you want to be able to grab the piece of fabric. So here's my my gold piece that I did do by hand. Now you might ask and it looks beautiful. It looks absolutely you cannot see the stitches at all and it's on there with hand applique. Um, you might wonder why I did that by using a facing rather than using needle turn applique. And my only reason, my primary reason, the big reason is I don't have time. If you have time to do needle turn applique, go for it. It looks beautiful too. But I have to put a facing on my applique when I do it because I can stitch much, much faster. I'm not doing the work of turning the fabric under and then stitching it. My, I have a facing that I'm going to put my stitch into. I'm stitching into that facing, which is what this, how this one was done. And I, the end result looks exactly the same as needle turn applique. And I didn't have to spend the kind of time that you would have to spend doing that. I've always got to be, time is my most precious uh, commodity. Okay, now, you also have to make sure that when it zigzags, it's zigzagging in the right direction. It's not zigzagging that direction, it's zigzagging this direction, and it's grabbing onto your fabric. So I've adjusted my, my, um, my, zig, my blind hem stitch, and I am going to go around. Oh, I'm caught up on my pin here, that's why it's not moving. There we go. Okay. And every couple of stitches, it takes a stitch into, and you stitch as close as you possibly can. Let's see if I can get in there really good. You stitch as close as you possibly can without catching. With the regular straight stitch, you don't want to catch the actual fabric. The only stitch that should be catching the actual fabric is the one that zigzags over. And so you stitch as close as you possibly can to that edge of the fabric. So it's kind of like stitching in the ditch. All you should be able to see are those little zag zags over, the little zag that goes Always, you can always pick up and adjust your machine. And like I said, if you want to do this on your lap, wonderful. Take it and do it like I did with the gold diamond. Do it on your lap. Take it with you. Carry it along with you when you're waiting in line someplace. Pull it out. Driving in the car someplace. Obviously, if you are not the driver, you're the passenger. Um... But if you want to do it by machine, this is one of the ways to do it. And in addition to any other type of machine applique technique that you want to use. Now this thread is a little lighter than I would like it to be. I don't like that it's this light on this block. I picked a very pale pink. I probably should have picked, I probably should have used the pale gray 
because that absorbs the color more. But you can see it is one technique of machine applique, okay, that looks fairly decent. Okay, so you can see how wonderful this looks because I've done that by hand. It's on there securely and you cannot see any stitches. This is on here securely. You can see the stitches somewhat. So if you're okay with that and you can live with seeing the stitches with machine applique, there's the difference between machine applique and hand applique. Machine applique is, you, you know, if time is of the essence, you could machine applique. Um, or sorry, if, if time is not of the essence, you can hand applique. If time is of the essence, you can machine applique. And there's multiple techniques. This just happens to be my favorite one. But this is a beautiful block. It's an absolutely beautiful block. Okay, so in summary, I'd like to say that I hope you enjoyed making block three. Um, this will be our reference for the other applique components in this quilt because I did describe how to do two different types of applique with this block. So with the other spots on the quilt that are done in applique, we will use block three as the reference and we'll reference the chapter that it is in the video. Thank you and enjoy block three.